All right. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Good. 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 Um, my name is Jordan Rodriguez. I'm Devin Garrett. And I'm Elijah Lewis. Um, and our topic is on Victorian children. So we created two products. One is a children's story, and another one is a earthquake simulator. Now we will be reading the children's story right now, and we will explain it. Just to go over the story for a little bit, um, it's basically about this character named William, who's about 10 years old and works in the, uh, who lives in the Industrial Revolution and works in uh, a cotton factory, or uh, who works on basically cotton gins, or gins. Um, and when going through the story, you'll realize that not only is it comparing the life of a brain work student to an industrial child, it also represents a little bit of Alice in Wonderland, how it gives a sort of nonsense to the story, and you'll be able to understand that. So, um, let's get started. There was a boy named William, and like many others, he worked to get money for his family and a roof over his head. Even though he did not have time for fun or relaxation, he still had in him a great imagination. After having a long dream, he wakes up and realizes that he's late for work. He jets out of his house, running as fast as he can towards the house or towards the factory, hoping the factory owner didn't notice that he was late. He arrives at his job and sees his friend named Clarice. He asks immediately if the boss notices him being late. She replies that their boss hasn't noticed him missing yet. While working on the textile machines, William hears some rumbling, and he, when he looks around, he sees that nobody noticed it. And when he looked around and asked them about the shaking, they paid no attention. He stayed to notice or started to notice the cracks in the floors all around him. The rumbling increased, causing it to fall to the floor. The cracks suddenly increased in size, ripping open the floor, swallowing William. Clarice tries to catch William, but it was too late. Falling to what seemed like his death, he noticed an owl waving goodbye, not knowing what it had meant. Having no time to think, he falls into a land that was completely plain. He was walking for a while until he heard a voice that had said, today we have a pal. Without time to react, stones shot out of the ground like trains. These rocks made patterns that eventually formed a maze. He tried to ask the voice what had happened, and after a while, he realized that he was alone. He walked through a maze for a while. After a little bit, it seemed like he was walking in circles, but he continued on. Going through and through, it seemed like days before William had made any progress. Nevertheless, William saw a light leading to an opening, and after finishing the maze, he had heard a familiar voice saying that you have finished the path. He had then heard a rumbling, the rocks all suddenly fell back into the earth and he fell with them. As William regains consciousness from the fall, he hears a constant voice repeating, you're late. He wakes up to see a little man telling the trees to point at him. Looking around, he saw the trees pointing at him with branches. Even though it did no real harm, William felt annoyed quickly. What is this place, said the boy knocking off the tiny man. The man regains thoughts and says, this place has no meaning. I say you should ask who I am. After all, I am the most important man you'll ever see. Before William could reply, the man yells, I am tall Tim. The trees clapped in reply. Waiting for a while, William replies, what is the name of this place, tall Tim? Well, brain works, of course. Any particular reason why? Well, does your brain work? William paused for a while to make sure that this sentence had made any sense. I like to think so. Well, that's the reason. William thought about this. It made no sense, but nothing did here anyways. Why is this place so different, William asked. This world is different from yours, boy. Every time you sleep, as soon as your eyes close, you see a new world. William heard this, but didn't pay all that much attention. He was too fixed on an owl looking straight at him. What is that? An owl, right? The owl flew towards William, screeching a tune that went, da 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 My word, boy, you found the owl, said tall Tim. The owl then dropped the key that fell onto William's hand. Take the gift, boy, it's yours, said the man. William picked up the key and stared at it for a while. Tall Tim then said, I have no service to you, goodbye. As he said this, the floors turned white, the trees turned into words, and finally, a boy in a strange jacket appeared on a chair and smiled. William stares at the creepy guy, smiling, and then all of a sudden, the maniac bursts out in laughter. Then words start popping out of nowhere. The maniac finally talks and asks William to read the words behind him. William replies, I don't know how to read, sir. The maniac answers, I read it myself, but I'm a little tied up at the moment. 
Would you like me to teach you how to read? William thinks about it, but is kind of scared of the deck, but ends up taking his up and soccer. The maniac then asks him to read the word fire. William recognizes the letters in the word, but doesn't know how to pronounce it. To give William a hint, the maniac turns it on fire, and immediately William says the word because he's familiar with fire. Then the maniac shows the word water, and again, William doesn't know how to pronounce the words, but recognizes the letter. So again, the maniac turns the word onto water, and William guesses the word. The maniac now tells William to say those words in a sentence. He replies, I see water on fire. This seemed odd for the boy, because water couldn't possibly be on fire. The teacher then laughed and replied to his confusion. This made William want to ask, how is this possible? The maniac told the boy in a serious tone, there are things that seem impossible in every world you see. I seem confused, or I'm confused. Everything in my world seems right. Really, because it, to me, it doesn't seem right for a boy to do a man's job. He then laughed and the boy went along as if nothing happened. After that conversation, William went through more teaching, learning what he is believed to be Miles created in section, sentence structure. At the end of the teaching, the maniac asked the boy, tell me, child, now what does the word say behind me? William answered without hesitation, escape. Correct, said the teacher. If you are a new, then why did you make me learn to read it? Because only you can help me to escape this place. Take your key and unlock this jacket. Hurry, boy. William then took the key that he had gotten from the swamp and unlocked the maniac's straitjacket. Once the maniac's arms were free, he kicked back into a door that appeared behind him. Once the maniac was through, the door closed. Soon after, William heard voices from outside the room yelling, Look out, he escaped. William decided it was time for him to leave the place. He tried the key in the door and as luck would have it, it failed. William then stepped through the door and landed on an empty plane. This place was plain, only grass grew. It seemed like the plains during the maze. It was as if the dream had looped. It, but there was an eerie feeling that William had, like he was alone all over again. As he walked around, he started hearing something, something that was falling. Just then a blue f our blade flew next to William, nearly killing him. The words on the blade were hard to read, but they knew but he knew that they were names of men and of places. And when he looked behind, he saw words, but before he could read them, he heard a voice in anger that said, no peeking. And then another blade fell, this time with another word on it. Knowing not to look at the back, he guessed the, what the word had meant. The voice told him that he was wrong, and a new blade fell, this time really trying to cut him. Only then had he recognized the voice as the one as the same in the maze. He finally said, I don't know these words. The sky turned dark and blades fell left and right, trapping William, and he looked above to see a final blade. Splash! Water hits William, and he wakes up to see his boss yelling at him for sleeping on the job. His consequence is not getting paid for the next week. William is upset with himself. He got back to work and noticed an owl at the window of the factory. Then seconds later, the owl starts to fade, singing,
we wanted to show them how to get the real feelings that the students had, such as confusion or not being able to understand what they were doing. And this is the same thing that William had gone through. He was walking in circles. He didn't know when it would end. And I wanted, or we wanted to basically show this kind of feeling so that not only the students, but also the panel members could sort of relate to it if they ever went through something that would be so difficult as me. Um, uh, and now we can see that there's Tall Tim. And yes, it is Mr. Walsh. We call him <laughs> Tall Tim to make him uh, you know, have show that he is actually a bit taller in the story. <laughs> but with all, all joking aside, this is <laughs> this is actually the first time we use satire in, for a character in the story, and to sort of actually use a character that was used in real life in the frameworks uh, in Brainworks. We also see that later on. Um, the main character, William, spots the owl and says, is that an owl? And to some of the panel members, it may not have made so much sense, but to every student, they know that if Mr. Walsh happens to have an owl hidden in his PowerPoint, and if some student raised their hand and said owl, he would sing the tune. Da, 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 da. <laughs> and yes, of course, he gave prizes to the students, and this was a perfect moment for us to introduce the key. So that, we used it to, again, you know, give that connection to the students and even to the panel members to find something uh, that was funny. And we also used this moment not only to poke at Mr. Welsh, but to also uh, give us sort of a, a comedic uh, feeling towards it. You'll see in the next section, which is English, that it has sort of a whole different feeling to it, from a comedy to almost a nightmare sort of horror. And it even switches from from map uh, to have some sort of mystery sort of case to it that went into the comedy. Uh, no offense, it wasn't anything that was supposed to be literally scary. Don't think of it as your room being scary. Don't worry, you know, it's fine. So um, yeah, you'll see that as we switch around, it's gonna uh, change to this sort of uh, nightmare feel. So then, this is pretty much just incorporating the English part of the day in a regular, for a regular student, and it's kind of just general English, not necessarily English here. Just pretty much learning how to read, learning about sentence structure and punctuation, and just like words on the wall. If you get a chance to look in the English classroom, you'll notice pictures and words all over the wall.
so the amplitude is converted to the Richter scale using a logarithmic function. And what a logarithm is, is pretty much you have the abbreviation of log and then a number written in subscript. And so here I just have x written. And then, then you have a normal number right after that, which is denoted by y. And then that then equals z. And so pretty much it then converts to whatever the subscript number is, is your base. Whatever the equals number is, is then your exponent. And whatever the normal number is on the log side, is then what it equals. So for this, let's say it's a 2.0 earthquake. The numbers for x would be 10, the number for z would be 2, the number for y would be 100. And that's pretty much how the Richter scale works. And so this is an earthquake model. We tried to figure out what the measurement on the Richter scale this would be, but we couldn't quite. Or, I'm gonna have to yeah. <laughs> and so some historical earthquakes that have happened near here. There were two big ones in San Francisco. One of them was a 6.8 magnitude, which is 10 to the 6.8 power. And that it happened in 1989 in San Francisco. The other one was a 7.1 magnitude, which also happened in San Francisco, and that happened in 1906. And four, the Earth actually split open in our like in our story. From the research that I did, it didn't seem like it was possible, but the most likely values on the Richter scale for it to happen would be around an 8.0 or a 9.0, because those are the actual numbers for when it actually feels like lasting terrain damage. And so <coughs> now we will turn on our simulator and it'll shake this factory and cause this to open and close. And so, and cover your ears if you're really sensitive to <laughs> hearing, because it's kind of loud. Welsh at the beginning, the factory owner is supposed uh, the factory 
lobby is our home room, so uh, most people go to the home room, so we decided just to put, because some people go in the street, so we need to put it in Mr. Walsh. Um, and basically, he's represented as the factory, Mr. Okay. Walsh. Yeah. So, do, so do any of your characters, do they mirror any characters of Alice? Um, well, in the sense of these uh, characters in this dream world sort of teach uh, William, it has that sort of sense. That's what we wanted to use from Alice in Wonderland, that sort of form of being able to teach through dreams. Um, th so the idea of teaching like the caterpillar towards Alice, you can sort of get that idea from, like, let's say, Mr. Welsh or any, any of Because all of the dreams that he goes through, it's not really shown, but he learns a little bit uh, throughout. And yeah, the, the sort of idea of the maniac, you know, always smiling, laughing. Uh, one, one reason was to get it to sort of have a nightmarish feeling, but the other reason was because it sort of does re represent uh, the Cheshire Cat. Okay. Um, science, uh, you guys talk about earthquakes and the Richter scale and relating it to it. Can you um, explain how an earthquake happens? Um, and maybe bring in convection currents into that discussion? All right, so an earthquake happens pretty much when two plates either slide next to each other like this, like this, or like this. They either pull apart and push together or just slide next to each other. And these are caused by convection currents, which are pretty much just when magma inside of the earth heats up, rises to the earth's crust, and then cools down and goes back down to the center of the earth pretty much. It's like little um, motion of yeah, it kind of loose. Sir. Okay, and perfect. So it, I think we're sensing you guys have a mastery of the material. But we're not explaining it. But but next time, this is just kind of a freshman evolution to sophomore year. I think put it into the presentation to go a little bit more into depth to give your audience a background of things that you already know. Okay. okay. Otherwise, I really enjoyed your product a lot with the earthquake simulator. Okay, you guys can say things like I know you boys know.
where you did such a good job and you sort of opened the, raised the bar and sort of opened yourselves to, to have been, you know, what if you could have done this and that? And you've got all the teachers sort of thinking, man, I could have had an exit. I think you did a fabulous job. I love the energy at the very beginning that, that you didn't sort of mumble your way into the presentation. You try to stay with the Right into it. The story was.